I pity a country that uh, would come up against us. Um, the synergy with air, land, and sea forces and, uh, and our ability to control the battle space and seize the high ground is devastating. All countries respect the power of the United States and they respect uh, how dominant we are in this region. And we get better and better and better. Tonight at 10, a rare glimpse of China's ambitious expansion in one of the world's most contested regions. We report from the South China Sea, where the Chinese are warning off anyone who comes too close to their building program. We continue our look this morning at what China does not want you to see. The United States says the superpower is reclaiming land in the South China Sea. The fact that we're dealing with a situation right now where we, the U.S., has to be much more aggressive in dealing with the Chinese government. CNN has learned that the U.S. Navy is about to send a destroyer there. Let's go to our CNN chief. CNN got exclusive access to classified U.S. surveillance flights over the islands. The threat of China is becoming big news. The media is beating the drums of war as the world is being primed to regard China as a new enemy. China's alarming creation of entirely new territory in the South China Sea is one part of a broader military push that some fear is to challenge U.S. dominance in the region. China is building airstrips in the South China Sea on disputed islands condemned by an international tribunal. This is now a flashpoint for war between China and America. What is not news is that China itself is under threat. These American bases form a giant noose encircling China with missiles, bombers, warships, all the way from Australia through the Pacific to Asia and beyond. I mean, if you were in Beijing looking out, you stood on the tallest building in Beijing and looked out at the Pacific Ocean, you'd see American warships. You'd see Guam is about to sink because there's so many missiles pointed at China. You'd look up at Korea and see American armaments pointing at China. You'd see Japan, which is basically, uh, uh, Japan's a glove over the American fist. I think if I was Chinese, I'd have a little to worry about, about American aggressiveness. And we have China surrounded, uh, and we're doing more all the time to try and keep it surrounded and deepen that containment of China. Uh, but China presents a fascinating case of a country that is independent, doesn't have foreign bases on its territory, uh, growing very rapidly, not as rapidly now as it did for 30 years, but still uh, the second ranking economy in the world. We have an adversary and that adversary is China, and that adversary, uh, unless there is dramatic reform inside China, will be our enemy someday. One myth uh, I think really that needs to be dispelled is that somehow China is aiming to replace America and, and, and going to run the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's not, well, first of all, the Chinese are not that stupid. The, the West, with its Christian uh, roots are about converting other people into their beliefs. The Chinese are not about that. It's it's just the co I'm, I again I'm not degrading the Western culture. I'm just pointing out the inherent nature, the DNA is of two different cultures. The Chinese two thousand years ago built the Great Wall to keep the barbarians out, not to invade them. As the world's economic power moves rapidly to Asia. The response of the United States is to deploy the majority of its naval forces to Asia and the Pacific. This massive military buildup is known in Washington as the pivot to Asia. The target is China. The great power game in the 21st century is called perpetual war. America's unchallenged arms industry, the annual prize is huge profits from almost $600 billion of military spending. 
once an imaginary weapon on Star Wars, the electromagnetic gun is now reality. You're sitting there thinking about these next generation and futuristic ideas, and we've got scientists who have designed these, and it's coming to life. And the smartest weapons need enemies. As a Pacific nation, the United States will play a larger and long-term role in shaping this region and its future. I have directed my national security team to make our presence and mission in the Asia-Pacific a top priority. In one sense, is the U.S. already at war with China? Yes, on the ground and in the air. The winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, President Barack Obama, has committed to trillions of dollars of uh, to our nuclear arsenal. He's committing trillions of future dollars to war and space. And we need an enemy for all this money, and China's the perfect enemy. The aim of this film is to break a silence. The United States and China may well be on a path to war, and nuclear war is no longer unthinkable. In a few years, China has become the world's second biggest economic power. The United States is the world's biggest military power, with bases and missiles and ships covering every continent, every ocean. China is a threat to this dominance, says Washington. But who is the threat? This film is about shifting power and great danger. It's also a film about the human spirit and the rise of an extraordinary resistance among people on the front line of a coming war where the words never again have an urgent meaning for all of us. This is Bikini, the rim of an ancient underwater volcano in the Marshall Islands. With its necklace of 23 islands, Bikini is a place of beauty and silence and menace. Look closely where the Emerald Lagoon suddenly falls into a vast black hole. This is the crater of one of the greatest man-made explosions, the hydrogen bomb they call Bravo. It vaporized an entire island and poisoned almost everything and everyone. As our plane flew low, we seemed to touch its deathly void. The Marshall Islands lie in the vast Pacific Ocean between the United States and Asia. Captured from the Japanese in World War II, They've long been America's strategic secret, its stepping stone to Asia and China. People here sustain themselves for thousands of years with abundant fish, breadfruit, and coconuts. They were skilled navigators who sailed by the stars Westerners might call this paradise. All that changed in 1946 when the United States took over the Marshall Islands as a trust territory, with an obligation to protect the health and well-being of the people. A nightmare began. The islands were turned into a laboratory for the testing of nuclear weapons and the people into guinea pigs. Crossroads, scene 24, take two. In this propaganda film, the Bikini Islanders are being deceived. Unknown to them, plans were already underway to destroy their paradise forever. 
Will you ask King Judah that the United States government now wants to attempt to turn this great destructive force into something good for mankind and that these experiments here at Bikini are the first step in that direction? Tell him that's fine. Everything being in God's hands, it must be good. Eighty-seven ships take positions three miles off Bikini to suffer the shattering impact of the fifth atomic bomb. Here will be An armada of warships was assembled in Bikini Lagoon in order to blow them to bits. <laughs> The decks of the 73 test ships anchored in Bikini Lagoon are scenes of feverish activity as scientists plot experimental programs designed to furnish data on blast effects of the mighty atom bomb. Animals of many Animals kinds were strapped to their decks like a perverse Noah's Ark. The experiment was to see how they died, how they burned. Special ointments are applied to determine their protective quality. Other parts of the exposed areas being left bare to the atom blast. Three, two, one, zero. green <laughs> Being on Bikini today is disturbing ghosts. I struggle through the jungle to the bunker where they press the button at 6.45 on the morning of the H-bomb test. Now claimed by the undergrowth, it's like a subterranean temple to modern times. They drank milkmaid powdered milk, smoked Lucky Strike cigarettes, and later this sign was erected that's beyond irony. It says, please leave this property as you find it. Thank you for your kindness and understanding. The Mamsells give their all for their art, and you can just bet that audience is giving with the wolf calls. The bikini, named after the atomic explosion in the Pacific. The bikini was an explosion everywhere. In 1946, the bikini swimsuit was launched to celebrate the nuclear explosions that had destroyed life on Bikini Island. The inventor of the bikini, a Frenchman, made his fortune. Today, a bikini body is promoted in magazines as an object of desire and good health. The bodies of the people of Bikini and other islands are the most irradiated in the world. All these women have had thyroid cancer. <laughs> I 
menunggu pula aku wandel tak? Yang aku lihat pun pawu bukanya ngah tu. Jep pawu aku dah bangga incoba para. Em pawu pawu ni tu kan? Tu orang ngah ibu ram lagi lubang. Elin cedera ni kalau kerja tu lah. Elin ngah mikir arti em tak rata area. Ilu pungane ajari rorar dari yang mendang teriuk. Elin rara panai ni. Today, bikini is unfit for human life. Radiation poisons the food and water. Our shoes registered unsafe on a Geiger counter. The abandoned cemetery looks out to where the sun rose one morning, then rose again as apocalypse. The equivalent of one Hiroshima bomb was exploded in these islands every day for 12 years. A scarred beauty has returned to the island, but the people haven't. Exiled to barren islands, many of them starve. In 1968, President Lyndon Johnson told them it was safe to go home. But it wasn't safe, and the U.S. authorities knew it wasn't safe. I jala ke mini tiangan karar kemana yang ada ngaji cep eksiden aglukun mulin karar karar tu kau tin kau kuri izin ya eni kan eni im ingkia pun air tu kau eno program barang itu kan karar nak kaga kaga itu jangan ancer wal payi ini pem aga kerja eksiden mana? What happened as a result of the Bravo test was that a cover-up was launched very shortly after March 1. I mean, there's such a history of wrong information, outright lies, deception. There was no, no attempt to take the most conservative approach and make sure that everybody was okay. They knew where the radioactive fallout was going to go. Uh, and they took that risk and went ahead and detonated the bomb, knowing full well which way it was going to go. Uh, they still had an opportunity to uh, evacuate, even on the day of the shot. But these people were not evacuated, we were not evacuated, and the people on Udrich were not evacuated. So that only leads one, one, up, uh, one to believe that, uh, number one, the United States needed some guinea pigs to study what the, uh, the effects of radiation would do. And uh, that, that's a pretty strong indication that the United States knew that. It seems extraordinary. Here we are, this far into the 21st century, talking to people still frightened of all that nuclear fallout, all those tests, all those years ago. The impression I get is that there's so little trust among people. The US is trying to provide as much information, as much good information as we can. Yeah. And so I wouldn't accept the characterization that, uh, that there have been lies and, and cover-ups. The word guinea pigs comes up a lot from these survivors. I would, I would refer you to our embassy website on that. I've read it. And yes. uh, that, that question was looked at during the Clinton administration, and that was oh. not the conclusion they came to. The secret of the Marshall Islands is Project 4.1. Declassified documents reveal a scientific program that began as a study of mice and became a study of human beings exposed to radiation. Chicago is where it all began, and to the AEC Argonne Labs in Chicago last week came seven men, natives of the Marshall Islands. Levin is from Uderich. He and the rest were irradiated by our March 1954 hydrogen bomb test. John is mayor of Rongola, which is 100 miles from Bikini. John, as we said, is a savage, but a happy, amenable savage. His grandfather ran almost naked on his coral atoll. The white man brought money and religion and a market for his copra. John reads, knows about God, and is a pretty good mayor. The Iron Room is a radiation detector for human beings. Inside, John, the mayor whose first visit to the white man's country meant San Francisco cable cars and Chicago skyscrapers and streamlined trains, whose first visit to the white man's country meant the Iron Room. 
A savage governs his life by ritual. And he understands this because he thinks of it as a new ritual. Sitting alone inside the room. Outside, a strange kind of priest in a long white coat. When the ritual of the Iron Room was over for John, it began for the others. As each finished, he was told it was over, and he was given apples and other good things to eat. Then he took off the ritual clothing, and the seven men put on the suits and top coats they had been lent in Hawaii, which they would return in Hawaii on their way back in the Marshall Islands, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. United States government documents clearly demonstrate that its scientists conducted human radiation experiments with Marshallese citizens. Some of our people were injected with or coerced to drink fluids laced with radiation. Other experimentation involved the purposeful and premature resettlement of people on islands highly contaminated by weapons tests to study how human beings absorb radiation from their foods and environment. These people are guinea pigs. They are part of the experiment Project 4.1. They're being returned to Rongelap, an island 100 miles from Bikini by the US Navy. They were told repeatedly it was safe to go home. This happy couple believed they were going home to safety. The man is John Anjane, the mayor of Rongelap, the happy savage from the Iron Room in Chicago. His wife is mature, and this is their baby son, Lekoj. They had no idea of the horror that lay ahead. They are being returned to an island described by a US atomic energy official as by far the most contaminated place on Earth. He added, it will be interesting to get a measure of human uptake when people live in a contaminated environment. The people of Rongelap remained on their poison island for 28 years as guinea pigs, the objects of regular scientific examination. The islanders pleaded with the U.S. authorities to move them to safety as evidence emerged that the second generation, the children, were also poisoned. Desperate to leave, the islanders called on Greenpeace to rescue them. This ship, the Rainbow Warrior, moved the entire population to an uncontaminated island. They called it Operation Exodus. <laughs> This is Dr. Robert Connard, a leading medical scientist of Brookhaven National Laboratories. Connard devoted his distinguished career to examining the islanders.
He wrote, the habitation of these people on the island will afford the most valuable ecological radiation data on human beings. The various radioisotopes present can be traced from the soil to the food chain and into human beings. Dr. Connard gained the trust of whole communities. When he brought the islanders to New York to be examined, he showed them the sights and had them over for a barbecue. When John Anjane's son Lekaj died, aged 18, Dr. Connard sent the man they called a savage a sympathy card from your friend, Bob. In 1957, Majua Anjane was the smiling young woman seen here on her way back to Rongelap, unaware of the danger she and her family faced. This is Majua 28 years later grieving the death of her son, Lekoj, from radiation poisoning. Like her son and her husband, Majua died from a virulent cancer. I don't see any great clinics that have been established by, if not the Department of Energy, certainly not by the US government. Uh, in, there's a clinic downtown in Montreux. Uh, there's also a whole, whole body counter. You can have the plutonium in your body measured as well. Anyone can for free. This is the plutonium measuring shop, where they'll tell you how radioactive you are. People waiting to be tested are welcome with a video showing their islands being blown up. And this reassuring commentary. Yahweh Kong Aulip, Etain Bill Jackson, program manager, of the Department of Energy, DOE, Marshall Islands program. This is Rinnock, a refugee from the poisoned island of Rongelap, whose family owned land and lived a secure, prosperous life. Now she lives in a shack in the capital, Majuro, with her children and grandchildren. She has no water, no sanitation. And power, she has electricity. In 1986, 
the United States granted limited independence to the Marshall Islanders on condition that they accepted a mere $150 million compensation for the damage caused by nuclear testing. A claims tribunal was set up and soon ran out of money. An appeal to the US Congress more than a decade ago still awaits a reply. <laughs> Darlene Keiju Johnson was a young health worker who became the champion of her people after she discovered the full extent of their suffering caused by nuclear testing, that many more islands were poisoned than the Americans claimed. This remarkable speech in 1983 broke the silence. I bring greetings from the Marshall Islands and throughout Micronesia. We have hundreds of women who have miscarriages. We have leukemia cancers. We have thyroid cancers. We have stillbirth babies. We have nowadays, I just gone back from home, and I have talked to many women and men in the population, is that we have babies we call jellyfish babies. A baby is born on a labor table, and it moves up and down like this. It's a colorful, ugly thing. It does not shape like a human being. It moves up and down like this on a labor table because that thing is breathing. That is a baby. In 1982, Darlene married Giff Johnson, the author of this tribute to his wife. Darlene was one of the liveliest, most entertaining individuals that uh, I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. She was a voice for the voiceless. Like so many Marshall Islanders, Darlene died of cancer, age 45. This is the largest of the islands, Kwajalein, occupied by one of America's most important and secretive bases. Known as the Ronald Reagan test site, it's a missile launch pad that commands the Pacific Ocean all the way to Asia and China. Here, the people of the Marshall Islands are once again being subjected to the testing of weapons of mass destruction designed for a coming war. The base is part of a remarkable plan known as Vision 2020. Devised in the 1990s, its aim is described officially as full spectrum dominance. This means control of all land Sea, air, cyberspace, and space. Five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. From California, almost 5,000 miles away, the US Air Force tests its intercontinental missiles by firing them at the Marshall Islands. Imagine a missile coming screaming out of the sky. Uh, it, it's absolutely terrifying. There, I think that there's there's really nothing that that I can imagine that that would be more terrifying than this. And and we're talking about uh, devices that any one of them could go off course. None of this disturbs life on the base, where small town America has been recreated, a wonderland of the suburban good. Thank you. Fabulous. But there's nothing better than living on a tropical island. I pretty much have beachfront property, you know? It's great. I love it here. J. 
just across the bay is Ebai Island. Known as the slum of the Pacific, more than 12,000 people live here on a strip of land less than a mile long. Many of them refugees from what is now the missile base and from islands poisoned by nuclear testing. Every day, people from Ebai are brought to work on the missile base to water the gardens and the golf course. Then they are ferried back to their poverty. This is apartheid in the Pacific. If I need a lot of things, what? medicine, Getting medicine, education, and job, vegetable and fruits. Vegetable and fruits. Yes. Here we are. It's a tropical island, and you need vegetable and fruit. Yes. Fish, vegetables, and fruit were once abundant on Ebai. Today, fish is contaminated by toxic pollutants said the Environmental Protection Agency. Now the only food most people can afford is processed and imported. They have the highest rate of diabetes in the world. When someone gets really ill, do they go to the hospital over on the base because they've got a pretty modern clinic over there. They don't treat, treat them with medicine. They just go there for taking the blood yeah. and then x-ray. So what happens when somebody is seriously ill? They cannot do anything. The most consistent example given is the example of the Ronald Reagan missile site and Ebi next mm. to it. On the Ronald Reagan missile site, there's a vivid example of the United States, golf courses and uh, uh, swimming pools and all kinds of amenities. Um, right next to it is what is called the slum of the Pacific. It's a, it's a challenge. Ebay uh, is in great need right now. We've talked about infrastructure. One of the projects the US is working with our Australian colleagues and with the Asia mm -hmm. Development Bank is a sewer and water project desperately needed for Ebi. Ebi is overcrowded, uh, the schools need repair. Actually, the US military did a survey back in the 70s mm. and found that the sewers didn't work and the water didn't run and the electricity wasn't there. It only happened not all that long ago. They found almost exactly the same thing. Why, why hasn't that been fixed? We've, there's complete agreement that Ebi mm. should be a priority and not only because of the the current activities of the Ronald Reagan Space and Missile Defense Site. Mm. But there's also now an additional uh, component mm. that is providing for global security, and that's the Space Fence Project by the mm. Air Force. Every missile fired on the Marshall Islands by the US military costs $100 million each. This derelict school bus is the only one on eBay they can't afford to replace it. The base is not good for us. The people of Marshall Islands, we have no need for it. It's being used to test missiles to fire at countries like China. Yes, and anywhere else if they want to. What would you like to see happen there? <laughs> I want our land back. This is Shanghai 
the historic port on the Yangtze River, China's greatest city. I had arranged to meet the American author James Bradley, whose latest best-selling book, The China Mirage, reveals an extraordinary hidden history of American power and modern China. It was almost illegal for someone like me to know a Chinese for almost all of American history. The Chinese came to America to mine gold and build the railroads, and Americans decided we didn't like the competition. So in 1882, we had the Chinese Exclusion Acts, which kept the Chinese out of the United States for about 100 years. So you have the largest population in the world that can't come to the United States. So at just the point we're putting up the Statue of Liberty saying we welcome everybody, we were erecting a wall saying we welcome everybody except those Chinese. Fear of a rising China today is the latest chapter in a history of propaganda that presented the Chinese as uncouth and infantile. To Western popular and political culture, the Chinese became the yellow peril, and racial stereotypes bore the constant theme of fear and threat. Boris Karloff as the evil Fu Manchu. His passion for power twisting his brilliant mind as he revels in the horrors of human sacrifice and torture. Behind the mask of Fu Manchu. This caricature of an entire people concealed another agenda, opium. For the American elite in the 19th century, China was a gold mine of drugs. Warren Delano, the grandfather of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was the American opium king of China. He was the biggest American opium dealer, second to the British. He welcomed the first American ship into China to help out with the opium wars. Much of the east coast of America, Columbia, uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, uh, were born from uh, opium money. The American Industrial Revolution was funded by huge pools of money. Where did this come from? It came from illegal drugs in the biggest market in the world, China. Let me get this right. The grandfather of arguably the most liberal president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was a drug runner. Yes, sir. Franklin Delano Roosevelt never made much money in his life. He had public service jobs that were very lowly paid, but he had yachts, he had summer homes, he had mansions in New York City. The kids went to private schools. He inherited a fortune from Warren Delano, his father, who was the American opium king of China. If you scratch anyone with the name Forbes in, in their name, John, uh, Forbes Carey, Secretary of State John Forbes Carey. That's the present Secretary of State. Yes, sir. You'll find opium money. His great-grandfather was an opium dealer. How big was opium money? Opium money built the first industrial city in the United States, Lowell, Massachusetts. It built the first five railroads in the United States. Opium money all over the East Coast, but it wasn't talked about. It was called the China trade. And if you go to various museums, you can see teas and silks uh, uh, exhibited, and they keep quiet about all that big opium money. In the scramble to get opium money, China was invaded and colonized by Britain and the other imperial powers. Foreign armies grabbed whole swathes of China this is the American army in Tiananmen Square, Peking, in 1900. Great cities like Shanghai were taken over and declared concessions, and foreigners lived a life of privilege and luxury amidst terrible poverty imposed on the Chinese. A 
a resistance known as the Boxer Rebellion was put down with the savagery. This rape of China set the tone for how China was perceived in the West well into the 20th century. This is the distinguished historian Theodore H. White, an advisor to the White House, speaking in the 1960s. Perhaps China is too vast to be governed by mercy. Yet if Chinese mind craves order, they must be brought to recognize they are the biggest factor in the world's disorder. And we must untangle the madness of their mind. The most difficult task in the world is to reach the minds of men who hate you. What White was really complaining about was the loss of a China that the Imperial West could dominate and the defeat of General Chiang Kai-shek who, with his famously powerful Christian wife, Mei Ling Sung, guarded America's interests in China. That is, until they were thrown out in 1949 by a communist revolution led by Mao Zedong. Mao had beaten Chiang Kai-shek three times in huge battles involving millions of combatants. Mao was a winner in this contest from the early 1930s on, but we knew very little about it, and people don't understand that even today. Shanghai hears the message clearly as foreign businessmen board up their shops. Go now, go quickly, for communism marches. Take what you can, but flee. In pell-mell haste, the Western powers evacuate the city they have built, for good and bad alike must leave. The businessmen come for profit, as well as missionaries come to heal, must say goodbye, as out the Yangtze steams the last of Western influence, and farewell to a century. Even today, it's difficult to understand the paranoia ignited by Mao's revolution. As we look at China on the map, we can see that China is the basic cause of all of our troubles in Asia. I believe that for the sake of our safety, it is necessary to be prepared for the possibility of a Chinese missile attack on the United States. One of the myths about Mao is that he was an implacable enemy of the capitalist West. Shanghai today is a prosperous international city, still run by the communists, at least in name. When I was last in China more than a generation ago, the loudest noise was the tinkling of bicycle bells. Mao had just died, the streets were dark, the universities were closed. The chaos of the Cultural Revolution had given way to a great silence. We're exhausted, was the freest comment I heard. Coming back, the change is barely comprehensible. Here in Shanghai, the freedom bears no comparison. Yes, there are issues with human rights, especially the right to speak against the state and challenge its power. Since I was last here, millions of people have been lifted out of poverty, many of them into an entirely new middle class. This epic is still barely understood in the West, or should that be willfully misunderstood? The truth is that China has matched America at its own great game of capitalism, and that is unforgivable. One measure of China's new capitalism is the Uran rich list. This league table of China's mega rich is published by Rupert Hugenworth, an old Etonian whose Chinese name is Huron. 
he's received many awards, including China's Man of the Year. This year, 2015, has probably been the most extraordinary year of wealth creation in the history of China again. You know, in, I've been doing this list for 15, 16 years. I've never seen a year like 2015. You know, normally for 200 million pounds or 300 million dollars, uh, we find, say, about 800,000 people. This year, 2015, it's, it's doubled. There'll be more dollar billionaires known about in China than in the US. So the US, up until now, has been the leader in terms of business, uh, and, um, you know, the most successful business tycoons in the world. China, 2015, will have overtaken the US. So, amazing. Modern China is full of telling ironies, not least this museum that was once the house where Mao and his comrades secretly founded the Communist Party of China in 1921. Today it stands in the heart of an exclusive, very capitalist shopping district. When you leave the shrine to China's great revolution, you're confronted by a surreal spectacle. For right outside where the Chinese Communist Party was born are the very symbols of capitalism. Starbucks, Apple, Cartier, Dolce Cabana, and down there, perhaps the free market's greatest triumph, bottled water that ensures you live young, costing six pounds for a small bottle in my hotel. Would Mao spin in his tomb if he was here? I'm not so sure. Hidden history is always a key to the truth. Five years before his great communist revolution in 1949, Mao sent this secret message to Washington. China must industrialize, wrote Mao. This can only be done by free enterprise. Chinese and American interests fit together economically and politically. America need not fear that we will not be cooperative. We cannot risk crossing America. We cannot risk any conflict. Mao received no reply. Nothing has changed. Mao Zedong was looking to be a friend with the United States from the beginning. Mao says, I will go meet Franklin Roosevelt in the White House. Mao reaches out in 1950 to Harry Truman. He reaches out to Dwight Eisenhower. His hand was tossed away. This opportunity that might have changed history, prevented wars, saved countless lives, was lost because the truth of Mao's overtures was denied in the Washington of the 1950s. State Department officials who had carried Mao's messages were condemned unjustly as communist traitors. Everybody who knew Mao, who spoke Chinese, was gone. In the 1950s, the State Department had no employees who spoke Chinese. It's resulted in us not having relations with the number one most populous country in the world. We don't have to accept the word of those who conjure up threats and false enemies that justify the business and profit of war if we recognize there is another superpower. And that's us. Ordinary people everywhere, like the people of Okinawa, Jeju Island, the Marshall Islands, China, the United States. By speaking out, 
they deliver a warning to all of us. Can we really afford to be silent? All of us out on the street thinks everybody should understand that killing don't stop killing very good. I don't care how it started, don't matter anymore, cause no amount of killing's gonna even up the score. No more war, no more war, until they stop that killing, we'll be here by the door, till everybody's singing, no more war. We know why they do it, making war that is. They make a lot of money off of the war biz. They say it's the price of freedom. We know that's a lie. They just like to make money, don't care how many die. No more war, no more war. Tell Congress and the President, no more war. Until they stop that killing, we'll be here by the door, till everybody's singing, no more war. And it's not just the people suffering the loss, 200 species every day, going with the albatross, the air, food, soil, and water, we've got to share it all. And any war upon the earth is a war upon us all.